Hi, in this video I'm looking at completing backwards scanning for this network here which represents Cameron's morning routine after we've already done forward scanning. So forward scanning analyzes the network and puts in the earliest start times on the left hand side of each of the nodes. We are now going to perform the backward scanning which is working in the opposite direction to forward scanning. So forward scanning started at time zero and worked out what's the earliest time I can start the project and that gives me the earliest I can finish the project. Backward scanning starts at when I finish the project and works its way backwards through the project to work out when is the latest I can start all of these activities. Okay, so because we're starting when the project finishes then we are going to put the finish time at the start of our backward scanning, so in our finished node on the right hand side. So all our backward scanning values go on the right hand node. And then I take this value and subtract off the activity time to give me the latest start time for that activity. So if I do that, 20 take 2 gives me 18. So the latest I can start F is at the 18th minute, which makes sense because I had to start at the 18th minute, it takes 2 minutes, making me finish the entire project at 20 minutes. So if I take from 20 minutes, take off 2, that gives, means that I can start F at 18th minute at the latest for me to complete my project on time at the 20th minute. It gets a bit different when we start having multiple paths. So let's have a look at this. When I have multiple paths coming into a single node, I just want to write my solution on the arc and then work out which node I'm going to put in my node later. So if we have a look at H, H takes 2 minutes, so 18 take 2 will give me 16. And then having a look at C, 18 take 6 will give me 12. And I pick the smallest of these two because the smallest one represents the latest I can start for both of these paths. Picking the smallest value we're saying that this is the latest I can start this entire sequence here where I have two things running at the same time because it means that when I finish I'm going to finish still on time because it's the longest arc, the longest activity that is going to create this time here. Coming back through again I can now do these next paths. So I'm going to do this one in the middle. I start with this 12 here. 12 take 4. Well, that's going to give me 8. And then I can work out these paths here. 12 take 1. Well, that's going to give me 11. 12 take 2 is 10. 8 take 4 is going to give me 4. I pick the smallest one again. I've got 4 in there. And then just doing my last activity, 4 take 4 gives me 0, which makes sense that the latest I can start A on is at the start of the project. I don't want to delay A because the project started, what's the point of hanging around? Okay, so that's backward scanning. So that gives me the latest I can start A, the latest I can start these three, the latest I can start E, the latest I can start these two, and the latest I can start F. Now from this we can identify our critical path. The critical path is a path through the network that basically follows these nodes that have equal values in them, but also following the arcs that cause that to happen, so the longest activities. So my critical path will be coming through here because I have to go through A. Coming through D, because that's how I get to this node, E, because this path here took a total of 8 minutes and it's definitely longer than 2 and 1. Going through six, uh, C, which was 6 long compared to 2, and then through F. So my critical path is going to be that path mainly through the middle there. So A to D to E to C to F. And that would be our critical path. That's the task that I cannot delay. The ones that I can delay, sometimes I would want to work out their float time. And the easiest way to do that is to actually set everything out in, an, in a table. So if we set everything out in a table where I've got the activity, how long it takes, 
the earliest start time, which I'm going to call EST for simplicity's sake, the latest finish time of each activity, because we're actually going to work with the latest finish time of each activity. The blue numbers at the moment were the latest start times, but we're going to put in our latest finishing times, and then we can have our float times. Okay, so each activity is each activity in the network. So I've got um, each activity. So I've got activity A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. And start creating up my table. Putting in those activity times, so A took four minutes, B took two, C took six, D took four, E takes four, F takes two, G takes one, and H takes two. Now I can go through and put in those earlier start times. So these are the times that were already in there. These ones here that came from my forward scanning. So I can have my earliest start time for A was zero, earliest start time for B was four, C was 12, D, earliest start time was four, E was eight, F was 18, G was one, whoops, no, G starts at four, and H starts at 12. Then I can go and put in my latest finish time. So before we, I was saying we were putting in the latest start times, which means that if I, t which was for the value to the left of the arc, so the latest start time of A is zero, latest start time of B is four. But if I take value in the right hand side of the arc, so the latest finish time for A is four, the latest I have to finish B by is 12. Okay, so these are the values from my forward scanning because these are the they tell us when I have to finish by. I can start B all the way at 4. The latest I have to finish it by is 12 because it only takes 2 minutes. I've got a bit of waiting time in there. So A finishes at 4. B finishes at 12. Well, has to finish by 12. C has to finish by 18. D has to finish by 8, E has to finish by 4, no, E has to finish by 12, read the right value, E has to finish by 12, F has to finish by 20, G has to finish by, where's G, 12, and H has to finish by 18. Okay, then to work out the float times, it's pretty simple, all you have to do is just subtract these values. So to work out the float time here, it's going to be my latest finish time. Subtract off my earliest start time, zero. Subtract off my time, which was four. And that's going to give me a float time of zero, which makes sense. We cannot delay A whatsoever. Working on B, B is going to be 12, take away my earliest start time of 4, take away the activity time of 2, and that gives me a float time, 12 take 4, take 2, it's going to be 6. So I can wait, delay B by up to 6 minutes. Working on C, I can do 18, take away 12, take away our activity time for C, which was six, giving me a total float time of zero, which again makes sense because it's on our critical path. I can't delay C. And we just keep doing this until we're finished. So filling in the table, we can see the float times now for all the activities. We can see now clearly that B, the earliest I can start B is in the fourth minute, has to be finished by the 12th minute, I can delay by six minutes. It's A, C, D, E, F, they cannot be delayed. 
Well, that makes sense. They are all on my critical path. G has to start at the fourth, but can start by the fourth minute, has to finish by the twelfth, so I can delay by seven minutes. H can start by the twelfth, has to be finished by the eighteenth, but can be delayed up to four minutes. And that's it. That is critical path analysis. You go forward scanning, do our backward scanning, you can see our critical path, and we can work out when things can start, when they have to finish by, what time can I have of any delays.